Nate, welcome to the show. What's up, John? Thanks for having me, man. Definitely, What's up, everybody definitely. out there? <laughs> so I have have heard from several of, of good friends of mine that uh, that I needed to get you on the show, uh, not only for your your baseball content, which is which is really good and creative, but also for your personality because you're you're a guy who connects a lot of people, which is really cool. Uh, but before we, we dig into that, I, I'd like to ask that our listeners just hit the subscribe button below just to make sure you don't miss any episodes. And I'd also love to hear your thoughts on the show. So if you could rate a review just to help to get the word out to, to highlight Nate and to highlight other guests that we've had on because they've spent their time with us. And, and the least that we can do is to just make sure that, that they get the credence that they deserve. But Nate, can, can you tell us a little bit about your baseball background and why you decided to get into coaching? Sure. Um, I mean, I think getting into coaching for me was like a really natural transition, um, knowing what I know now, um, as a coach, looking at dudes that are on the teams and being like that dude, you know, he's going to stay in the game. Um, I was always pretty enthusiastic and, um, think I was a good teammate and stuff like that. All the things that like stand out to someone looking like evaluating players and being like, this guy could be a really good coach. I didn't know that about myself at the time. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, Shaker Heights, played with uh, Matt Guerrier in high school. Matty had a 10-year big league career. Um, went to the University of Cincinnati, uh, played with Euclid at Cincinnati. I know you, you retweeted one of your episodes from last week. Yeah, he did, it's actually. Seen, you guys had he's a Cubs king coach of, on. We'll, we'll, uh, yeah, I posted. He actually – so he's into, like, hops now. He's the Greek god of hops on Twitter, which is kind oh, of yeah, funny. I, I, I went out to uh, to see him out in Los Gatos a couple years ago and uh, visited his brewery and everything. One of our teammates is actually Dan Reinick. He's actually the general manager out there for the brewery. So that's pretty cool. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that group of guys has stayed in touch. Um, after college, you moved to New York, um, kind of thinking my baseball career was over and that I was going to move to New York and finish school there and become an artist and sort of like try to go through that transition that everyone goes through where you get start getting out of the game and getting into like the real world. Um, <clears throat> but started coaching baseball. It was it's the only thing I knew how to do. Um, and the only way I knew how to make a living. So I started coaching baseball. And uh, I mean, my own like developmental curve as a player was sort of weird. Um, didn't hit much in college. And this happens like you, you talk to guys. Usually it happens because they're playing pro ball they get a chance to get into pro ball and they kind of something kind of clicks when they're like 25 years old. Um, but I started coaching and I was like hitting a lot in the cage. I was just doing lessons, working at a, a little indoor baseball facility um, on the upper West side of Manhattan. Um, not very, I mean, New York baseball is not very good as everyone knows. Um, it's not Southern California or anything like that. Um, but I was for the first time, I was sort of thinking about like different, exercises that I could do and I was hitting in the cage a lot and I was teaching so I was getting more into understanding movement and stuff like that and it started having this like crazy effect on me also so a couple years after college um I'd been doing lessons and just hitting in this in this basement for a few years um and I get a phone call from and this starts off like a very weird like 15 year <laughs> kind of journey around the world um, I get a phone call from this guy, Terry Goldberg. He's the head coach of the uh, the the men's fast pitch softball team for the Maccabee games, which is like way out of bounds. Like, I mean, obviously like every kid I wanted to play big league baseball. And now I'm getting a call from a fat men's fast, all Jewish men's fast pitch softball team. Um, but it was sort of the first opportunity that I had to start playing again since, since college. Um, so I went to Israel for the first time. Um, and played over there in the Maccabee games. It happens every four years. It's kind of like the Jewish Olympics. Um, and we won a gold medal, and I was like, damn, like, I feel good, you know? Um, and the next summer played a full season of men's professional fast pitch softball, which I didn't even know existed. Um, and that, again, like as like a training tool, it's kind of like hyperspeed baseball. The pitchers are like 45 feet away. The hardest throwers are throwing like 83. So it's like the equivalent of like a hundred, a hundred plus mile per hour fastball. Um, and so it kind of cleans your swing up a little bit. It's like taking like over speed EP or something like that. Um, the following year, there was a professional baseball in Israel. I'd already been to Israel before to play. Um, I was 
27 years old and uh, went and tried out, ended up playing in the Israel Baseball League. Each of these little like snippets is sort of deserving of a full story, but I'll just go along in these bullet points. Um, first professional baseball league in the Middle East, sort of a semi-disastrous experience and experiment. Um, this guy, Larry Barris, who was a, a, had a, a bagel company in Boston, had started the league, um, hired a few people, but Israel's not set up to support a professional baseball league. They flew in like 120 players from nine different countries, um, but there's no fans, there's no infrastructure, there's no stadiums. We're running out of wood bats. The league was running out of money. It ended up being a player strike because they stopped paying us. Um, but we made it through the season. Um, the next year, I got an offer to play in Germany. So I went, played in, uh, in, in Munich and lived in a mental hospital that was right next to the field, um, which was continuing this sort of uh, untraditional kind of path in baseball. Um, <clears throat> moved back to New York. I was sort of in this rhythm of leave for the summer to play, come back to New York, like a lot of kind of minor league guys do, do lessons and stuff in the winter. Um, opened my own baseball academy in Harlem, um, in New York. Did that for a couple of years. Um, I was also traveling, still traveling to Israel to like coach the national team um, for the European championships and just sort of stay in the mix there. And then in 2012, Israel got invited to the, uh, to the World Baseball Classic for the first time. And so I went down to camp in Jupiter, Florida, um, and ended up being sort of the 29th man on a 28-man roster. So in the World Baseball Classic, you get to carry 28 guys, but you carry a third catcher who gets activated if someone gets hurt. So I kind of filled that role that year. Um, and then following that experience, I actually moved to Israel to be the executive director for Israel baseball for three years for that time between the 2013 and the 2017 WBCs. Um, came back for the qualifier in 16. We qualified that we had sort of a disappointing loss in 2012, qualified in 2016. Um, joined the team in, uh, in uh, 2017 for the WBC in, in Korea and Japan. Um, we had a great, great run. We can get into that a little bit more later on if you want to talk about it. Um, did a couple of years in the Cape and then jumped on uh, in 2019 with the Dodgers after all of these years and this sort of winding path um, at every level from like running a T-ball league on uh, 96th Street in Manhattan on a asphalt basketball court with a bunch of five-year-olds up to uh, working with big league guys. So it's been a weird, that's awesome. sort of an unusual, an unusual path uh, into pro baseball for me. Oh, that's awesome. And and there's yeah. just so many different directions that, uh, that we can go with that. But the first one I, I think that that is really cool is you paint as well. So like the painting behind yeah. uh, you, uh, you said that you were painting earlier, you write, uh, you're a DJ. And so uh, one, how did you how did you get involved with all of those skills? Was it something that you did when you were younger, and then baseball was just another thing that you did? Uh, but I, then I'd also love to hear how you think that creativity piece that you have, like being able to see a, see a canvas and being able to to make it work, uh, how that helps you with being a baseball coach. Sure. Um, I mean, I didn't really identify as being um, an artist until I thought I was done playing baseball. I mean, my really my identity was uh, was as a baseball player, and my expectation was that was, that's what I was going to do with my life. Um, as that sort of spun out and realized, all right, I'm not going to be a big league baseball player. Um, I was into, I was not, not a good student, but I was into writing and sort of come from a bit of a, an intellectual family, sort of semi-eccentric family. Um, and so it was sort of a natural thing for me to get into. I went back to school for creative writing and then that sort of led into making visual art. Um, and I've been writing and making, you know, painting and making sculpt some three-dimensional sculptural stuff for, you know, 15, 20, almost 20 years now. Um, and uh, I have a very, very, very small independent publishing company um, that basically started off as like a vanity press for me to just put my own stuff out there. So I didn't have to sort of ask permission um, for people to, you know, if I could, you know, get a book deal or whatever. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, we also publish uh, some writing from prisons that working on some criminal justice reform stuff. 
Um, so, you know, it's sort of hard for me to identify how does my artistic life cross over into my baseball life? I mean, when I'm on the baseball field, I'm just very much a baseball guy, you know what I mean? Um, but some of that same energy is there, um, some creative energy and also just like a willingness to like kind of do anything on the field, you know, Mm -hmm. um, let's design practices in like a crazy way. Um, let's have fun. (laughs) <laughs> like first and foremost let's go out there and like have like the right energy and have fun and that's I think I believe in both like one like correlation I think between art and baseball that's sort of where the good stuff is when you're not like working with fear you're having fun like that emotion infusing the work with emotion really is where like learning happens I think and with my own work like with painting if I'm like scared or like anxious about the outcome of a painting it's you you can kind of like feel it when the work is done and then if it, if i'm working without fear when i'm painting it's so much i mean it's so much more enjoyable and then usually the result is better too no, i love that and and there was one thing that uh, <laughs> that a mutual friend of ours said uh in tyler gillum and he goes ask him about this is word for word i'm reading the text as we speak he goes ask him about his philosophy of his stretch routine that will be a funny answer because the guys loved it. So I, I'm teeing this one up for you just because right, I, 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 I want to laugh and I, and I want to get to hear about this. But tell us a little bit about your uh, stretch routine. Well, I mean, stretching is, first of all, you got to get loose, obviously. Mm-hmm. But really, it's like family time. It's like the only time you're going to get, we get everyone together and like, let's get, get like, kind of like locked in at, at the same time. After that, it's like, this dude's doing this, this dude's doing this you know, guys are in, pitchers are here, everyone else is there. This is the only time we're really going to be together um, and, and spend time together and like kind of set everything. So we go through like a regular, like I, I'm kind of the dude in the Cape, at least one of my roles was to lead. And I was with Gillum up there. He's my man. He's, I know he's in Savannah right now um, with the bananas revolutionizing the game of baseball, which is awesome. Um, but one of my things when I was up there with uh, Pickler and Gillum and Austin Knight and, and Berto and all these other great coaches that were up there um, was to lead stretching because we would, we'd get these like chants going <laughs> and like, and like, I also, I've done this almost everywhere that I've gone to coach where you get like a soul clap go basically. And everyone's just like locked in on rhythm. We're clapping, we're singing, we're chanting. And then it's like, boom, let's break out and get and get into BP. And everyone just like gets it. I mean, it's just such a fun way to get everyone on the same page and roll into BP, like re- really ready to go. You know what I mean? It, you can't blow the stretching routine. You got to you got to get it right. No, I love that. And, and it, yeah. to me, it, it sounds like you're almost uh, it sounds like something that football has done for millennia. Yes, it is. Yeah, dude. And but we as baseball coaches we're too cool for that sometimes you know I mean exactly exactly you got to be like you can't be scared to be a little bit stupid only sure. problem was if you're in a, if you're at like a visitor's park and you're like mm-hmm. <laughs> barking and clapping <laughs> like down the line <laughs> yeah, everyone's kind of looking over they're starting like fuck these guys like what That's <laughs> like so you yeah. ha- it, it, you do have to, I, we were always respectful about that but um, mm-hmm. especially at home we'd kind of let it fly a little bit more. Oh, I like that. And, and again, that's yeah. just part of, of building the culture around a, 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 a shared vision and you're getting to know the guys. And, and one thing that, that everyone that I talked to told me about you and what you do well, and, and I don't, I'm awful at taking compliments, but take this one say thank you. And then tell us a little bit about how you All do right. it, but, I'll take it. but with gaining trust and building relationships and, and a big part of that is you is what I've heard as you're able to get to the core of the player, get to the heart of the player and truly understand and empathize with them. But you're also, you do a good job of, 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 of laughter, like that being a big thing too. And so tell us a little bit about, I, I don't want to say strategy. I, I put strategy as the question, but it, it sounds like it's listed out, but kind of what's your, what's your thought process and how to do that with so many different players from so many different backgrounds and you've been very cultured, which is really, really cool because you've played in so many different countries. So you've gotten to see it, but kind of what's your, how do you go about building relationships with players with so many different cultures that you've gotten the chance to work with? Sure. Um, I mean, this goes like way beyond baseball. Um, It goes to just relating to people in general. 
I think, I mean, really the love comes first and the change comes second. Um, I'm not going to kind of inundate you with like information and hope that that's like what triggers it all for you. Sure. It's like, dude, I really, really love you. We have this common ground that is baseball and which is mm -hmm. the, really the common ground is your success. I mean, I want you to succeed and you want you to succeed. That's where we meet. That. You know what I mean? That's why we're doing this. Um, so there's some common interest that makes it easier, like regardless of anything, like regardless of our culture, regardless of our politics, anything like that, we have common ground and that's super important. And that common ground is baseball and your career, you know? Um, and so that feel, that sense of like, I basically love, like, I love you. I support you. I think, you know, player development is just, it's just human development. Um, I think it's equally as complicated and players need the same things to be successful that human beings need to be successful. Namely, they need support. Um, and, you know, oftentimes people don't need to be told what to do. They just need to know that they are supported and that's what, and then we can start, like, they'll kind of make the decisions that you always wanted them to make anyways, if you're not barking it at them, but you're like, I'm here, I'm going through this with you and stuff like that. But, you know, as a young player, and even as a younger coach, I didn't realize I was doing that. I've become a little bit more aware of it now and a little more like to use your word strategic about it, knowing that that's what works. Um, at first, I was just sort of being myself and being like, really just love my teammates um, as a coach, really love the guys. Um, I think that's the most, you know, really, that's the takeaway at the end of the day is is what you share with your with your teammates and and uh, other members of the coaching staff and stuff like that. So it ha I have become like more conscious of, of my ability to do that as I've gotten older. Um, but you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's very much human behavior, human development and, 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 and leading with love and this shared like enthusiasm for the game. Um, and then it's like, also, hell, I mean, like we all know everything now, but like, if you're on Twitter and, and Instagram, it, you're, you're, there's so much information. It's like what I know isn't really going to be my differentiating factor. Um, being the diagnostic part and like, okay, this is the thing like that you need to work on. I will share anything with you. I'll try not to give you too much at one time, but like you, anything I know you, you can have, but let's get, let's get to know each other a little bit first and figure it out together. And then I will help you, you know what I mean? As much as I can basically. Now that's fantastic. And, and is that uh, just going back on the previous question, do you use the stretch routine and th that being family time? Do you use that as an opportunity to uh, get to know all of those guys? Yeah. You know, I always like who's got a story, but it's always the same dude. You know, not everyone's a talker. Yeah. But a lot of the, you know, the cage is a good place. You just try to find your spots. Um, cage. A little bit. Um, sometimes in the circle. Just getting the, th that's more is like a collective, like culture for everyone to, you know, talk a little bit and, and, and get the vibe right. Um, as far as one-on-one, -on -one, you just pick your spots at the park, like depending on like where, what the schedule is, but the cage is like the spot though for hitters and, and hitting that, coaches, yeah. the cage, the cage is where it really, the relationship really grows, you know? Oh, that's fantastic. And yeah, and something that, that I've been digging into later and, and you've, you've mentioned the word love several different times. And I used to think it was kind of like a sappy emotion, like, Oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I love you, man. But I also think that, that it's a verb. And I think that it, if, if we're truly committed to loving our players and we're truly committed to putting their success at the forefront of, of our everyday uh, actions, then, then that's, then that's love. Right. And, and putting them, putting them first and then doing things, spending time with them, asking them questions. But I, th I think that all of that encompasses uh, that word. And, and that's something that, that I've been, I've been really like honed in on lately. Uh, but I'll, something else that I also want to hear about, uh, and you've mentioned this too, is, is your time at the time at the Cape. Uh, and we could go in several of your different stops, but this was, this was something that uh, Gillum told me to say, Hey, ask him about a stretch routine. And then I heard several people talk about, Hey, your time at the Cape. And I know that, that that's an opportunity to be around some of the best amateur players in the world uh, and some great, 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 great coaches. And so tell us a little bit about that time. And then, um, and then we can dig in into some coaching stuff a little bit more. Sure. Um, 
I was in the Cape in uh, 2017, 2018 um, with YD, with Scott Pickler, who had been there for about 20 years. They were coming off a four-peat when I got there. We didn't win any championships, so Pick, Pick won't let me live that down. But we had two really, 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 really good teams from a um, – a lot of success from if you just look at our, our regular season record and our playoff runs, but also uh, the the kids that were on the team. Um, I mean, the Cape is funny because it's all these dudes that have kind of been dudes since high school coming out of like, they're like freshman, sophomores at a big time programs. And you show up in the Cape and it's like a little bit of a, of a like ego check for them um, because you're wearing like, five-year-old like jerseys and you're playing on a high school field and there's holes in the cage and uh you're hitting with wood and like the arms are pretty good it, it, you're struggling a little bit everyone's pretty good so it's this great taste kind of kind of professional baseball for them. um my i know that my style of coaching compared to the college coaches that they were used to was more like a pro like approach like you're in charge of your development you can try some different things um, you know, it, it's all like you're in charge. I'm not going to tell you to, you have to do this. You have to do that, which is what a lot of college coaches have to do because they got to win games and stuff like that. Um, it's not so much just about development, but it's a great sort of pure baseball experience. The fans are great. The scouts and the scouting directors are out there. I mean, we'd have uh, a bunch of scouting directors out, you know, water in the field, working on the field during the day. So That's super awesome. casual, but really, really high level mm -hmm. experiences and conversations and, and, and really impactful. I mean, sometimes you'd be like, if this is what the dude needed to hear, we'd be like, yo, dude, this could change your life like this summer. Like, no, um, we had Nico Horner in 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember he got, he went in the first round to the Cubs, for, was the first guy from that draft to make it up to the big leagues. And at some point, I just remember hearing him make a comment like that summer changed my life. And Nico's been good for a long time, obviously. That's awesome. He, he remembered it as like a pivotal moment for him. So if that's something that it got, not everyone needs to hear that. Like most of the kids are, are sort of aware of that. And you don't want to freak them out either. Mm -hmm. um, most of the kids are pretty aware of the opportunity. But um, so they come in. They wear bad jerseys. We play on bad fields. Um lots and lots of good players then the draft comes around the next year and everyone gets popped in the first three rounds mm -hmm. and you're like wow like and now you every everyone so many of our guys are like top 10 prospects within their organization um and that's just really rewarding i mean the guys that pickler has seen come through there is just just crazy um so i think as a coach as a player and as a fan it's just about the best baseball experience out there um, because of the casualness and the level of access that you have to one another as fans and players and coaches and, and, and just also the level of, of talent is so high. No, that's, that's great. I, I love hearing about that. And, yeah. and again, with, with those guys too, I just reading into this from the outside, looking in, it almost seems like you want to do some of those crazy stretch routines like that, just to calm them down. Because again, it, it's, mm -hmm. they're, they're in such a stressful state and a stressful situation uh, and then they're they're getting all of that thrown into into that. So I, I think that 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 you did a fantastic job of implementing that, just because uh, it, it probably helped you know just calm them down for the game and helped with some team cohesion, uh, especially when you're seeing these guys for what like two months maybe. Yeah, uh, a couple and, months. So that's really neat. And there's a lot of a lot of guys coming and going. Um, World Series ends late. This guy you drop this mm -hmm. guy, you pick this guy up. There's a lot of innings limits. So, mm -hmm. you know, arms are coming in and out. And so it's like a lot of new faces over the course of the summer. And a lot of the kids are uh, um, like a little intimidated about, mm -hmm. about what the experience is going to be like. So being, yeah, like make, being like, everything's okay, you know? Perfect. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I love that. And so you're more of a hitting guy than any, anything else. Uh, so I've, so I've heard, I, I don't know if you, if you would consider your, yourself a, you know, hitting coach or, or whatever. I know that you're a good coach. Uh, and you've had to do so many different things in your career, which is which is probably why you're very well rounded. But uh, talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on the swing. I know you've worked with so you you've worked with people who are just not on hitting Twitter. I guess we could put it like that. And so you've worked with guys who don't. You've worked with big leaguers, but you've also worked with 
some groups of people who have never played the game of baseball before in their entire life, which is really, really cool. And so you've gotten to see the dynamic between those two different levels. And so I, I'm just inter- interested in, in, you know, take us through kind of your philosophy on that. And then how, just in the end, how do we develop better hitters? Yeah. Um, I mean, like so many of us in my lifetime, I've watched like a full revolution and um, a technological revolution and then sort of a totally different approach to uh, like understanding like modern swing. Um, and so I don't dive too deeply into being like, this is the way and this is the way. I mean, one of the, we, we're all in this funny pattern of being like, man, 10 years ago, I didn't know anything. And be like, now I really got it figured out. But like in 10 years, you're going to say the same thing about yourself as a coach and about the game in general. Like it's so much better now. We finally understand it, you know? Um, So I I think the game change, it does change slowly. Um, Our understanding of it changes faster though than the game itself. And so there's, there's all these updates. Um, But so I try and look for like some kind of like unified theory from that like bridges, like the old school and the new school and like the big leaguer and like the, the little league guy in, uh, in Israel or wherever, whatever country I happen to be in coaching at the time. And like, it's, it's pretty simple. You want hitting, being a good hitter, you gotta be a good athlete, you know, um, you gotta be able to get it, be on time. You gotta be able to, stabilize your body through the movement that stuff is like just applies everywhere whether you want to talk about like what the barrel is going to do or what the most important move within the within the overall pattern is that stuff changes a little bit and it can get real like everyone knows it can get super granular and uh and nuanced but the commonality is athleticism um timing ability to you know, stay in your legs, stabilize through through your legs and like pelvis and like midsection and everything. And um, we could talk, I think, endlessly, depending on how deep we want to go on actual movement. Um, but you know, get on time for a heater, and uh, and I've really <clears throat> moved away from uh, internal cueing mm-hmm. um, as a hitting coach. Um, but to co- just quickly to get back to the Gillum thing in the Cape. I thought I was going up there to be, to do hitters and infielders. And I show up and Gillum's out on the field with the infielders. And I'm thinking, this guy's a pretty good infield coach. I guess I'll just, I'll be over here. Like if anyone wants to like hit BP, I'll be throwing flips in the cage. Cause he really took charge there. I, I love, love, love working with infielders. So I'm kind of like on offensive with the hitters on defense. I'm kind of paying a lot of attention to the infielders in mm-hmm. particular. But Gillum kind of wrangled wrangled that away from me, and rightly so. I learned so much from him about uh, infield sure. play and base and base running. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, to get back to get back to hitting, what, what what where was I at exactly in the hitting thing? No, and another thing that that I've mentioned or that was mentioned to me is is you really like uh, you were talking about internal cueing, and so we can we can talk about that if oh, you yeah. want to. But I'd also I love to. Important. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, go ahead. So I've got, I've really moved away from, from internal queuing um, and gotten much more into, because of it surfaced, I think as a trend in baseball, but um, specifically because of uh, working with the Dodgers and, and Sean and other guys in the organization, getting into like self-organization and and through tasking. So just basically using external cues and and being really creative with practice design and being like, first of all, I don't understand like, the body well enough that I'm going to say the right thing through external cueing. Um, this dude's going to figure out he's a pretty good athlete. His patterns are probably a little different um, than everyone else's. And that's the path to like his success, basically not me being like, you know, push your heel into the ground or get, do this or that. So uh, really that's been part of the revolution, including tech information and technology and modern swing is moving from internal to external. And so this is something we've all gone through, you know, for sure. For sure. I I agree. And I I think (laughs) I've, I've been internal and external cued to death uh, by Nick Winkleman. And it's just so, so vast uh, the research behind it. And and so I, I would encourage, you know, obviously listeners to do some research about that. And I know Nick's Nick's book is, is really good. And it talks, uh, 
very, very deeply into a lot of those things. And, and I say that I've been, I've been cued to death uh, in a good way, just because it's so, it's, it's such an important topic, but he, but he does a great job. And, and again, you, you hit on it as well, but something else that, that I've heard that you do well and, and that you, you put uh, very high on your level of importance and that's visualization. And I, I think that, that I, you know, I've gone a lot of different ways and I, and I'm to the point now where I, I know that it's extremely important. And I used to think it was eyewash. <laughs> and then the more I read about the brain and the more research I do about it, it's like, oh, well, it's really hard for your brain to differentiate between what's real and what's imagined if it's vivid. Uh, so talk to us about uh, how you do that, how you get buy-in for that. Because as a player, I was like, come on, man, like, you want me to literally sit over there and close my eyes and imagine me hitting a baseball, like, come on, you know, but now as, as a coach, I'm like, it's pretty freaking important uh, to be able to do that, yeah. especially, you know, you're injured, you're sitting at home, uh, the time that we're in right now, uh, you've gotten a 1000 reps of BP the day before, or just anything like that. But just kind of walk us through your process of teaching and teaching visualization, uh, getting buy in for that. And even if the importance if, if you want to go into that, too. Yeah. Uh, so again, in the Cape and other places where I coached, um, when we get out there early, um, I would invite guys to come out to the batter's box and we would go maybe two or three guys at a time and go through sequences and things like that. Um, part of it is just about spending time in the batter's box. I mean, if, if the only time you're spending in the box is a few, couple rounds of BP and you're um, at bats in the game, BP is not necessarily a hugely pressurized situation, but there's a, I mean, the only time I'm spending in the box is like basically pressurized and, and, and kind of tense. I don't have time to get to know this space and think of it as my space and just like hang out here. So it's like hitters, let's go to home plate and just like hang out in the batter's box, basically. Um, let's get in the box. Let's feel the space, you know, your distance, where you, how you want to set up everything and you can go as slow as you want and it's really incredible what you can do um, if you walk through a sequence or just whatever one, repeat one pitch how well it, and anyone do this coach player whatever go to the box get set up see a pitcher out there righty lefty whatever you got for the day and see okay ball out of hand um track it in good you know good take good swing good approach and just you can get your reps just four hours early out at the field, just hanging out in there and bringing that sense of like, this is my space when you get in the batter's box and not like you're on the moon, like freaking out because you're nervous, basically. Um, but having a sense of command and like conducting at bats and like commanding that space and sort of reversing the pressure dynamic to the pitcher. Um, is like huge and I didn't make anyone do it. So you, as far as buy-in goes, you kind of hope that the guys like you and will, are willing to do something maybe they've never done before and go do it. And also it's, it's a bit it's pretty low stakes. We're just going to spend 10 minutes in the box um, going through this stuff and almost everyone would do it. It, it was totally optional. Um, it was fun and almost everyone would do it. Um, a, a little hard to quantify if it was working or not, you know, you'd like to think, Oh yeah, this dude, hit the ball hard three times because we did uh we hung out in the box for 15 minutes this afternoon but um very low risk and potentially good good uh reward i think on that definitely and uh, something that i've that i've learned too is is we want to know the difference between science and pseudoscience uh, and so you say it's, it's hard to to really know if it made a difference but if it made a difference to that player then it absolutely made a difference. And, and research shows visualization is extremely important and, and it does make a difference over time. But especially for the player, if you're like, hey, I want to take flips uh, standing up on my head because I did it yesterday and I went three for three. And you're like, oh, okay, dude, you know, sure. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Whatever you got. Let, let's exactly. do it, man. Yeah, for sure. And so, and so you've gotten to see some different uh, perspectives from again, I, and I've, I've alluded to this several different times, but I want to dig in. Uh, you've you've come from such a unique perspective because again you you played baseball here you played with some very high level uh, players. Uh, by the way, did you have that weird stance whenever he was at Cincinnati? I don't think that he did. So can you can can you confirm or deny that? Same thing. We can talk about you full time if you want to. I got I have so much <laughs> so many stories and so much to say about him. That's um, great. 
he he didn't have the feet together, hands apart mm-hmm. thing, which he which he had in the eventually in the big leagues. But he right. had an equally bizarre stance, really wide, really low. All right, so imagine this: if you're in the if you're in the first base dugout, it was like the barrel of the bat was like the tip of the bat was like <laughs> facing. He says his hands were like straight out over home plate um, and he was really, really wide and really, really low. And then he would just sort of like pop up into like a semi-regular hitting position <laughs> and then he would barrel it up <laughs> that's like, awesome. with incredible consistency. I mean, he was uh, hit around 400 with 20 home runs just about every year in college. Scouts oh, did man, not crazy. love him because you've never, you've kind of never seen a guy like him. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of, you know, c- kind of big, didn't look great running. He ran okay, actually. Didn't look, didn't look great, you know, playing defense, even though he was a pretty good defender. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't have a comp, really. I mean, maybe uh, Bagwell, but he didn't even look as good as Bagwell. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, um, awesome. but just he just uh, uh, could hit undeniably. You know, very few people have that the ability um, to do that. And so, if you put up those numbers that many years in a row, someone's going to give you a shot. You know. Well, while while we're on the subject, what's what's your best story? Like, what's your most told story about Kevin Euclid? Besides that, because I I love that that one was really really good. We were uh, playing against Butler. We were playing in a minor league park in Indiana somewhere. It wasn't. I, it might have been their home field. Maybe they played every home game there. And it was a midweek game. No one's there. Like, uh, we go into extra innings. We go into the tenth, and you hits. Well, it looks like a pop-up to dead center. And the the center fielder is kind of drifting back on the ball. And the thing lands like <laughs> 30 rows deep and is just like rattling around in this like empty stadium and, and, mm-hmm. and center. And we were like, all right, that was, that was weird. That was a little different. And that was one of the first moments um, where we were like, all right, this dude is a little, little bit different. It was a bit, first of all, it was a game winning bomb, right? So he, he liked those situations, which made him a little bit different. Also, you saw a little bit of the power. Um, he did not have he had good power. We played at a small park, so you could like scrape balls out to center field. Mm-hmm. Um, with Wood, I know in the summer times with Wood, he kind of showed a little power, but not like a lot, a lot. Not, not to the point where you're like, this dude's going to hit fourth in the big leagues between. Uh, right. Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz, you know, which is what ended up happening. So yeah. we saw like this little flash of like, oh, whoop, this dude just took this game and ended it and like hit one 30 rows deep into center field, you know. I love that. And growing up a Red Sox fan, I I, <laughs> I emulated his stance a lot whenever I was growing oh, yeah. up. And and obviously really? it, it 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 didn't work out for me like it did for him. And so that's that's so that's so cool to get to get to be able to hear that and and to get to be able to play with him too, which is which is really, oh, really neat. Cool one of one of my favorite teammates ever we're still in touch a lot and uh just good friend and teammate oh that's great that's great but yeah uh with with the unique perspectives that you have again you played at a very high level here in the states and then you played professionally you said germany and in israel uh and yeah. was there is there anywhere else that 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 i'm missing that you played besides those two places oh yeah um i've played and coached in like 20 something different countries so oh just gosh, a very wow. little okay. little bit in the dominican a little bit in puerto rico played in argentina mm-hmm. tournament down there uh not not a lot of time um italy holland uh germany um many weird uh eastern uh that those were in tournaments for the israel national team and european championships mm-hmm. uh uh korea japan um so yeah a lot, a lot of, yeah, a, no, lot of no, a lot of different see, continents and countries and stuff like that yeah well i definitely envy that in a lot of different ways and i think that that it's really i i, I want to try it and as best i can to hear your best uh description of what does america's pastime look like in those countries and, and then kind of how how has that shaped you as as the coach that you are now because again we we're very, we're very like blessed to be able to get to work mm-hmm. with some some of the most amazing yeah. athletes who grew up playing baseball in their lives and so we take so many different things for granted and it's a privilege to be able to do that but getting to see it in in some different countries that it's not their pastime like it's not what they do every single day 
uh, kind of how has that shaped you as a coach? And then can you give us some different perspectives from maybe some different countries that, that you visited that you thought were really cool? Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good uh, exercise, um, if nothing else, to work at different levels. Like if you're only accustomed to like the pro environment, um, that's fine. You're lucky, first of all. Um, but you will broaden your like skill set as a coach to coach little league and to go someplace where no one understands baseball and have to really, really, really break it down to the point where like, if you're right-handed, the glove goes on your left hand um, and you hold your hands together on the bat and you're, you stand sideways. You don't stand on home plate facing the pitcher <laughs> with the bat over your head. Yeah. Really, really let's bring the lens way out, bring it way back, explain that on offense you hit and run the bases and on defense you catch and throw. And mm -hmm. um so it's really a really good exercise to have to do it, basically. So not everyone's gonna have the opportunity to go to a country where there's no baseball and, and try and bring baseball there, but most people could probably have the opportunity to go coach T ball for a season or something like that. You know? Right. Yeah, for sure. It's really, really good. It's really good for coaches because kids need very specific instructions it's not like everyone just shows up to the ballpark and knows what they're doing um and so it 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 like teaches you learn things just basically um from doing it um you know culture is a very funny thing um it's somewhat beyond our control it's not like baseball became popular in uh venezuela because the uh, venezuelan association of baseball does a good job in as a bureaucratic entity it just it crops up you know what i mean it's organic it's like culture is sort of beyond our control um so you know as executive director for israel baseball um we did a pretty good job of introducing um baseball to israel and growing the game and had uh teams and leagues in 16 different cities around the country had about a thousand players um but it's still not massively popular and I and no one else can can do that. Um, there has to be something I think that's reflected in the cult in the national culture and the game, whether it's the pace of play or oftentimes it's farming and, and baseball um, match up well together um, as far as whether that's a big part of your culture and, and where the game is played. There is a history of war in baseball as, as U.S. soldiers travel around the world building fields and playing um that's sort of the story of how it happened in germany where i played one year um but there has to be something that the national culture sees reflected in the game for it to spark um so there are, it's different everywhere um it's very very interesting to see all the things that we're used to um at high level high level baseball mistakes being taken away that environment the language the body language the way you wear your uniform the timeliness i mean what do you do if timeliness isn't a part of the culture where right. you are and then what do you do if your authority as a coach is sort of taken away because really we derive our authority as coaches from the fact that you're making decisions that the player cares about mm -hmm. like they care if they're hitting third or ninth or not playing they care if their career ends and you control that process and that's where your authority comes from what if they don't care <laughs> in the first place and their author your authority thing about it. So it really uh, is, it can be very, 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 very challenging to introduce baseball into countries um, where it doesn't already exist. Um, there's, you know, small scenes in several countries in Europe. There's starting to be European guys. I remember uh, 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 Kepler, the right fielder for the mm -hmm. twins was like 17 and was playing in Germany. Yeah. He's super good. Uh, he was playing outfield for, uh, Regensburg, they do a great job. Uh, Marty Bruner, I think, is still there um, mm -hmm. producing players. Just a little scene in Germany, it's pretty good, you know. Uh, Holland and, and their connection to Curacao, um, the Netherlands, is, is pretty good. The league in Italy is, is pretty good. There's pockets. It's not massively mm -hmm. popular, but there's pockets, and they're doing a good job developing guys. Major League Baseball has a little presence there. Um, obviously Asia is, is really, really, really big. There was the cult that it happened there. You know what I mean? The spark mm -hmm. in Korea and, and in Japan, it happened. Um, they're wild about baseball on a massive level. Um, sure. so can go on and on. Um, culture is a very, 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 very complicated thing. 
mm-hmm. it's a good thing that it's probably beyond our control. We probably mess it up if we can control it, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, right. So it's all good. Like um, many of the same principles apply. Um, some, some do not, and you have to really adjust, you know? Right. No. And, and I, again, I, I love hearing the different perspectives and, and we were talking yesterday and uh, one of the challenges that you had in Israel was, was, were some of those things. And, and so I know that uh, you were or are the national director of, of Israel baseball. I know you're on Twitter, you're the king of Jewish baseball, which is really, yeah. really cool. But tell us a little bit about some of the different challenges that you faced whenever you started that, because I, I think that that, again, it, it would be like us as coaches who we've done it for a while, going back and maybe coaching T-ball of like, hey, here's how you stand in the box. Here's how you wear your belt. Make sure that you're like, just tell us about how you boiled down what was actually important. Because again, I think that we as coaches in the United States, we take for granted uh, some of the things that naturally happen whenever you grow up around the sport and then you you decide that, okay, these are now important because they already have a, a, an understanding of, of these other things. But what did you feel like was, was really important and, and how did you go about really just teaching the most important things and growing their love for the game, but also helping them to get better fundamentally? In going to Israel, the mission was basically um, to, to get more kids playing. There were many, many other things. I mean, I, I got Israeli citizenship um, to be able to play for the national team. Um, we started a academy for the top uh, 19 U players in the country. It was recognized by Major League Baseball. Um, we started a, a coexistence program for Arab Israeli and Jewish Israeli kids to play together. Uh, th- we started, you know, we had the national team program. There was a big we had to fundraise. There was quite a large picture of, of activities, but really what it boiled down to is uh, we had to grow the game, get more kids playing, get the base bigger so that the, the top of the pyramid also gets better. Um, and so, yeah, you have to say, Hey, what's this about? What's really fun about baseball? What's going to get kids that have never, ever seen baseball. They don't have any mental sort of model um, to, to, to like doing this. First thing, easiest thing. They like, everyone likes hitting the ball put it on a tee, let them whack it and run around the bases. The th- that actually can spark an entire like, like commitment to baseball. The thrill of hitting a baseball is transferable from any to any country and any age, you know, the Israeli gym teacher, you know, who might be a 45 year old woman would grab the bat and, and, you know, take a swing and, and hit the ball and, you know, shriek with like enjoyment at having done it. So there's something that's really transferable and universal about the joy of hitting a baseball, which is sort of cool, right? For especially for hitting coaches to hear. Absolutely. Um, um, and I mean, like anything, the kids had to like. No one likes baseball because um, of the its complexity. At first, eventually, you do. That is why you like it. That's why I like it. But. At first, you're basically just going to see someone and be like, I want to be like that person. And that person is a baseball player. So like stars make movements, like stars make leagues, stars make kids want to do things like and they see someone that is that they want to emulate and that person is a baseball player then it's on. Then they'll do all this stuff to be like that person like we all did. When we were little kids, we saw like camp counselors and big league players on TV and stuff. And you're like that I'm doing that. And you just do, then you go, you go into the process then, even though some somewhat unconsciously of transforming yourself into that person, you know? And so the role model thing is huge. Having star, a star to look at and be like, that's awesome. I'm basically, I basically want to do that. So that's very much a transferable thing. Just sort of the, the magnetism of like superstardom you know what i mean um that's transferable to any culture so if you can have some people to point at and be like this dude this dude this dude that's that's hugely helpful as well no and and uh, do you think that that 
Uh, it helps whenever you, you have big leaguers from their communities, uh, help obviously I think that would help them to grow the game and, and to emulate those guys. So being able to see their players on TV and, and around the world, uh, that is obviously helpful as well. Yeah, totally. And it, there's a unique relationship in Israel because there's the American Jewish community that is somewhat involved in baseball. I mean, we see, um, guys at, at almost every level of baseball, even quite a few players, um, that are from the Jewish community in America. So there is like some involvement. It's sort of, in a sense, I guess it's the, the sort of sport for the, the American Jewish, not hugely popular in Israel, but there is a connection. There's, there's minor league guys, there's big league guys um, that can come over there. We can say, hey, this dude's wearing an Israel uniform, like in the World Baseball Classic, like get to know him, it, you know, and they'll shoot videos over for the kids. So that was sort of our model um, for creating this, like creating some stars for them to, and guys for them to look up to. And a lot of the guys have traveled to Israel and gotten Israeli citizenship. So that that action has been hugely beneficial and has allowed us basically to compete in stuff like the World Baseball Classic. We couldn't bring the domestic national team um, of, of the Israeli born players, even though there's some guys that are okay um, to play in something like the World Baseball Classic. We have to use the heritage rule which says that you don't have to be a citizen of the country that you play for. You only have to be eligible for citizenship. So where uh, any Jewish American is eligible for Israeli citizenship. And so by default can play for Israel in the world baseball classic. And that allows us to have like a high level pro level team basically. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, let, let's dig into that. And you got to uh, experience the world baseball classic, which I'm, I'm sure we could have an entire episode of, of your yeah. experience there. But let's go. Let's go ahead and dig into that. I know you. You got to, the opportunity to coach with Jerry Weinstein, who's just basically the goat of coaching in general and learning. I think yeah. I've seen him at literally every conference, and I'm like, Jerry, you're like almost 80 years old, and you're still in the front row, still taking notes. Yeah. And it's fantastic, and I I love yeah, that about yeah. him. But you've gotten to see like a personal up close look at, of what that looks like. So tell us a little bit about that experience uh, with him at the World Baseball Classic as well, and also what you what you learned from from being there with at the World Baseball Classic and with Jerry. Sure, I mean it started in in, in 2012. I mean, if you look at the dudes that have come off of these teams in 2012, 2016, the qualifier, and then the actual tournament, 2017, and moving forward into I don't I think they just rescheduled the. Um, they bumped it the next WBC from 2021 because the Olympics are going to be played, I think. Um, but anyway, in 2012, Osmus was our manager. Uh, Kapler was our bench coach. Andrew Lorraine, who's still with us, was our pitching coach. Mark Loretta, somewhat randomly because he had played with Brad, I think, uh, coached third. Matt Martin, infield coach. Sean Green's on the team. Uh, Jock was on the team. He was a minor leaguer at the time. Um, so the dudes that have come out of these teams, then in 2016, we had Breslow, um, Ryan LaVarnway joined us, Ike Davis. So it's like, I mean, Brad went to Dartmouth. I think Varno and, and uh, Breslow both went to Yale. We had a bunch of guys from Duke. Um, we have dudes, we had, uh, I think Sammy Fold went to Stanford, I think. So we have dudes coming off that team, a bunch of really smart guys with good experience that get popped for like analytics jobs. I mean, Corey Baker, who was with the Cardinals for a long time um, as a right-handed pitcher in the minor leagues, was in the big leagues after he retired with the Twins as an analytics guy. Sammy Fold is with the Phillies front office. Kapler's managing in San Francisco. Brad is going to get I don't know if he's got anything going on right now, but certainly we'll get more opportunities. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, like a crazy group of, of good baseball people. And then, and then ultimately Weinstein in 2017 had a lot to do with our success. Uh, he also coached in the Cape the two years I was there. He was with, uh, with Katuit and then, and then uh, Wareham. Um, so I've got to see him. And I see him also, like, if I go to, like, meetings or something, he's always there. Like you said, he's, like, the ultimate learner and teacher and like preparer. <laughs> um, if I learned anything from him, I mean, his level of professionalism is super high. It just kind of no BS. Like we're going into this meeting with really good information. We're going to be here for a while, probably. 
Um, and we're gonna do absolutely everything that we can to try and ha have an advantage in a sort of a weird situation. It's not like regular season baseball. Like it's these tournaments where you're like scratching together scouting reports of guys you've never really seen. They're from other countries. You're trying to get good information. So the prep is, is really important. It's not like everyone has the same preparation. If you can sort of out prepare someone, you may, you may be able to scratch and win that way. And that had a lot to do with us um, winning. We won the first, in 2017, we won the first round in Korea, um, won a, a game against Cuba in the second round in Japan and then lost two in a row to be eliminated. Like, won a million dollars in prize money for um, Israel baseball to go back and build some facilities in Israel. And um, Jerry, you know, taught me a lot and I'm still in touch with him. Um, you know, uh, Jerry Naren was also on the coaching staff. He's the bench coach for the Diamondbacks right now, I think. Tom Gamboa was our third base coach. So uh, Tom had long, 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 long time in pro baseball, including as a major league coach. Um, so, like, I was sort of the young guy on the team. I'd, like, throw all three groups, <laughs> VP, every day. And uh, I sort of filled that role of the younger guy, but learned so much from them, you know. Um, all, all three of those guys and even going back to 2012 also no that's really really cool yeah and that's that's literally an all-star staff and, and it's that's, unreal right the, the dudes on that team are so great no no kidding that's awesome uh and so let's let's go ahead and, and dig into uh, you so you've taken all of these different experiences and from all of these different uh, parts of the world with different people and, and some of the literally some of the best in the world so what would your let, let's dig into some practice design because again I, I know that this is an area that that you think differently about but you're also you're structured with also some area some some area of creativity with it which i think is cool and so what would your preference of style of practice to be let's say you took over you know a, a general baseball team not starting a new organization in, in a different country but what would your style of practice look like uh, how do how would you go about it and just kind of take us through it a little bit yeah i mean i think practice design in general is super important it deserves a lot of a lot of attention and like part of me part part of the role that i um have filled at different times is sort of like a field coordinator like make a schedule tell everyone what's going on and and kind of get after it keep everyone on track which i really like doing um so you know it depends like it depends what level um um it depends how many the size of the group. Um, it depends if it's a team or if it's a, a training atmosphere where it's more about, you know, programming over a long space of time and not necessarily having to win games. So you have like all these different considerations. Um, but as far as team team, it's like, let's look at what's primary and, and, and let's be good at that as far as uh, be, have, having healthy arms that can like throw strikes and do some things like that. Like pitching, dude, like, get your programming right, get your, all yeah. your throwing stuff right. Uh -huh. like, it's so important. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot, a lot of time on uh, like what we all grew up spending like four hours a day on and like college practices, like trying to do first and third defense mm -hmm. and bunt defense. I mean, one of the things I learned from Larkin, um, any defense is about playing catch. Let's mm -hmm. play good catch. Um, let's play catch from positions. Let's mm -hmm. um, throw from different angles. Let's be sort of um, improvisational and movements, but practice being improvisational. So we're actually good at it. You know what I mean? I don't want to have to make like a power feed from like second base because it's the right thing to do in the game. And I've never even practiced it. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, there's so many factors, but um, let's play really good catch. Let's hit a lot. Um, let's try and get real, like, speed. Let's get up to, like, re real speed. There's going to be some learning that we have to do. But once we get there, let's make sure everyone's ready. Let's do live at-bats. Let's do some machine because it's challenging. Um, and let's, you know, be creative. Let's do weird stuff. Let's put the T real low. Let's put the T real high. Let's, uh, let's have a, a pretty wide, um, like variety of things and challenges. And again, external challenges. This is a new challenge. This is not to the point where the guy's failing and he's like lost, <laughs> right? But where it's, 
you're being challenged into learning and, ha and having fun and lo a lot um, to consider. But let's look at what the goal is and then let's, let's figure out a path, you know, and let's adjust it if we have to also. Right. So uh, with that, uh, obviously that comes with uh, the environment and the culture that you're setting up to. Uh, and so uh, that's a little bit about practice design, but you also hit in not being afraid to fail some. Uh, and so what, what is the importance of environment and culture uh, within the practice design, but, but also within the program that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to convey? Because uh, during this time, there's a lot of coaches that are going to be uh, changing jobs at the amateur level, whether that's college or that's, uh, or that's high school or, you know, whatever. And so there's going to be a lot of new head coaching jobs that are going to be coming open. And I think that this is literally the most important thing that you can set up whenever you take a new job. And that's an environment and the culture that, that they're going to walk mm -hmm. into on day one plus. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about how you would go about building that. Uh, because again, you're a connector, you're a guy who does those things really well. Uh, advice on that. How would you do it if you took over, a, 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 let's say, a head college, small college job tomorrow and you wanted to make sure that the players knew that you were bought in and, and take away recruiting and things like that, but just kind of how would you go about it? I mean, culture is basically a byproduct of your values, right? So these are our values, dude. Like, this is how we do things. Um, and you hope that sort of permeates out through, through, but you need, you need a lot of pieces too, to make sure it's right. It can't just be one person saying that stuff. It needs to be like, you need to kind of get a, quite a few people in there that are going to do things the right way. And then it starts to take hold. Um, but just stating your values, you know, this is, this is what we're about. We're about, uh, you know, leading with love and doing, and doing things the right way. And it's also like really easy to say this stuff. Everyone basically now knows to say this stuff. No one's like, I'm going to, you know, be a hard ass about everything. No one says that, but it's about actually doing it, you know, um, like all the time um, and not having some breaking point where you abandon those values, you know, um, I think that stuff really works. Um, but yeah, good values, good people to, to, to stick with it and not, and not abandon them just because something's not working or something like that. Like, I really, again, it's, everyone says it, but it, I think it really comes first. Like you can win, you can lose. A guy can make it to the big leagues or can fizzle out. Um, but how you do it is super important. You know, like these are, these are our values. We're going to do, we're going to do everything that we can um, to, to do this the right way. And, you know, the outcome might not be what we want, but we're going to do everything, 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 everything we can to maximize our chances of, of, of doing this right, you know, and making good, good decisions and if infusing it with the right kind of emotion. Well, that's really, really good. Well, I know I've, I've taken up a lot of, t of your time today. And, and again, I could sit here and, and listen to you and, and we could swap stories for forever. But just to get to get the ball rolling on some quick hitters and some lightning style questions before you get off, what's yeah. something that you've learned lately that that you're really that has gotten you really excited? Um, I don't know why this this even comes to mind. I remember Craig Wallenbrock was a uh, consultant for the Dodgers, hitting consultant. Um, I was watching some videos of some cage sessions that they did, and he was like. Um, you know, we always hear hands inside the ball, which is, it can be a good command. It's probably not a great one, but it's really barrel in between your hands and your body. And so some, a lot of people are like teaching this like barrel move, um, which can create some length. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not. But his thing is like the barrel needs to stay in that box as you rotate before it gets out to the front. Um, and I see guys like taking that weird, I always was like, what's this? I do it too, as a hitter. Why do guys take that weird practice swing where you keep the barrel kind of above your hands? Like you'll see like Bregman or, and like other guys do it. And that's the feeling that they're, at, that they're going for. That's keeping the barrel between in that box. Like you do with your arm too, when you throw until it releases out. And so that was an, a really good way, I think, of understanding what your barrel move should be or shouldn't be. Like, you kind of don't make a barrel move, you know? 
Um, it's, mm, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a detail. Um, I don't know why that's what, what I thought of just now, but I'll, I'll throw it out there, you know? Yeah, Craig, Craig's okay. Like Craig is, yes. Craig is, is an okay hitting guy. So good, man. dude. So good. Man, I, I've, I've heard, and, and I wish, I wish I could uh, get to learn more from him. I know that he's literally one of the best hitting guys in, on the planet. And so uh, any nuggets from him are always welcomed and appreciated. Uh, what is something that you do with your players uh, that you know that they love? So let's say that, that you're going to, uh, you're going to, let's say, let's, let's rewind. Let's go back to the, to Cape Cod where you got to be with a really cool group of players and you're, and you're going to show up tomorrow and you're going to be like, Hey guys, we're doing this today. They just, they love it. They explode. They, they're ready to go. What would that thing be? Honestly, it's getting the clap going during, uh, er, during early work and, and stretching and, and getting that unity and that rhythm together um, and throwing good BP. The guys like that. Yeah, oh yeah. That helps. yeah you can make a lot of money in the game by throwing money bp totally uh what what about with like uh with with the israeli kids was there something that whenever you showed up um that you decided hey today's going to be a fun day is there anything that comes to mind with that same thing the clap again this is one of these like universal transferable things the music the musicality of it um and so uh, that's why i do it that's why i started doing it. it's like yo, i'm in a place where like no one speaks english like how am i going to coach you know, right. well, we can, <laughs> we can all clap our hands, dude. Like, no doubt. you know, so let's do it. And so, so that is, that's something that can, it works everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. I may be, I may be hijacking the quick hitters, but there's two things that come to mind whenever I talk about that. Number one, when I watched, um, I watched the movie about the band queen and, and they talked about the, we will, we will, we will rock you song where they do the, you know, dun dun sh, with the claps and they yeah. wanted to get, like a feeling of hey you we can all make music together and so that heightened that just uh, their ability to connect with the fans which is really really cool but also i was reading uh, phil jackson's 11 rings book and they taught he talked about that because he's very very in the tribal culture uh, mm -hmm. and native american tribes and he talked about how he would like go around beating drums like getting ready for meetings and different things like that. Have you, have you dug into like the research behind that? Or is that just something that you stumbled upon and no. be like, this, this crap works? Dude, it, you don't need research. A lot of, oftentimes you don't need research. You can sort of intuit the, uh, that it works. You can like feel it really. Um, but it makes sense that there would be science that supports that, but you can really just cool. feel the, the, the connection that happens, you know? I love that. Yeah. What is your biggest coaching pet peeve? So let's say that uh, that we all are very judgmental people, and and to a fault, yeah. we're judging in our minds, you know, and and totally, and and I need to be less so of that, but I also think that we judge because we have learned that is not probably the best thing to do. So whenever you see another coach doing X, uh, it's kind of a pet peeve of yours. What would that be? Over coaching. <laughs> is one um you know trying to we can't re we, we try to because it's like our job but you can't really control the game you know um and so letting go a little bit helps sometimes so uh too much like on on a dude i mean pick does this i get on me and pick disagree scott pickler up in the cave we disagreed about so much i and i love him to death like it was all good you know it, it, it didn't affect our, our relationship in a bad way. It actually affected our relationship and our coaching staff in a good way that we would have these conversations. But I was like, dude, chill out. Let the guy take one swing where you don't kind of try and drive it home again. Like, so that's his style. It actually works. I disagree with a lot, of, a lot, some of his uh, methods, great results, great, great baseball coach, great game manager, mm -hmm. especially, which is an art I think that we're losing. Um, sure. In baseball, a little bit game management and uh, just locking in on the actual on the actual game because we're so heavily into uh, like individual development, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I, I love that, and I, I also want to throw this out there too for coaches: is it's it's okay to agree to uh, disagree with each other, and it's okay mm -hmm. to have discussions about that too because you're you're so much differently personality wise than I am, and we may see things differently, but so do our players, right? And we obviously we could disagree behind closed doors and be unified whenever we leave. But at the same time, it's like, you know, 
I, the ideas that I have for myself and the entire team may be different than yours, but together we can work to a, a solution that, totally. that works best for everyone. But I like totally. that. And I like that, that he was even open to doing that with being, you know, 20 plus years of being able to do that and him having the open mindedness to be able to allow you to coach and to listen to your ideas, which I think is a really, really cool trait too. Sorry for hijacking the light. This was the lightning section and I think we're going on like 20 minutes. So sorry for hijacking it. Yeah, it's the same, same. Uh, what is something that you failed at lately that you don't mind sharing? Um, everything. <laughs> like I said before, we sort of exist in a constant state of mistake. Like we're going to look back at this time and, and realize that we were wrong about so much stuff. Um, but I am ultimately a failed uh, baseball player and a failed artist in a lot of ways. Um, so failing, I've been failing at a lot of things for a long time. Um, I am pretty easily excited though. And so that, I think if I have any skill, it's that um, kind of bounce back from failure and uh, get excited about whatever's next. Or like, even if any little good thing happens, it's like, forget about all the, <laughs> all the bad stuff that happened and, and be really, really easily excited about the good stuff. Um, but I know that's not, not a specific answer, but have a, a, a legacy of, of failing <laughs> that I'm proud of. <laughs> if we haven't failed lately then we haven't we haven't really put our put ourselves out there at all yeah and so the last one i've got as far as this goes is what are some of your favorite books and resources and these could be baseball specific but don't necessarily have to be but just what's some what are some different things that have helped shape your coaching career um i think really experience i mean my reading is much much more geared towards um other kinds of literature and I do not read, I mean, I, I'm on social media, obviously. So I get, you see the videos and, and conversations on Instagram and Twitter, which are like amazing resources. We've actually seen the Twitter movement sort of come into real life with those guys getting a lot of jobs um, as hitting coaches in pro baseball. Um, which may be a good thing or maybe a bad thing. I don't know. I, I mean, there's a lot of really knowledgeable people out there. Um, so those are good tools. Um, but my, my reading is much more geared to other kinds of literature. Um, and that stuff, again, is transferable, though. I mean, whatever you're learning, if you're reading a novel and it, it's helping out your like, like emotional IQ in some way, um, you will bring that, whether you know it or not, you will bring that to the ballpark with you. Um, and so it's just this huge sort of mix of your experience, um, the, uh, and your, the, the learning tools that you brought and, uh, all the, the, the best teacher is the game. I was just thinking like, there's nothing better than paying attention to the ball and the game, um, and being in tune with that. Um, you will inevitably lay awake that and remember things and learn things. I, th I really think the game itself is the best teacher. All right. Well, I will, um, uh, if there's any listeners who, who want to get in touch with you and I, I know that, what I was saying is I know that there will be just to, to get to hear some of your different experiences. Uh, I'll link the, uh, your Twitter down below. I know you've mentioned that cool. a couple of different times, but I know that, uh, that we've truly, truly enjoyed getting to spend some time with you today. And I, 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 I want to make sure I reiterate that, that thank you for spending time with us and, and getting to share so many different cool stories, but, uh, I'm going to uh, let you have the mic. I'm going to mute myself and let you take over. Is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? Um, no, I mean, I've, I've talked a lot. Thank you for having me um, and for doing the podcast. You have a lot of great guests on here and it's a really good tool for uh, lots and lots of baseball people to hear from one another, even if they don't know each other. Um, I am, you know, I'm an open book. If anyone ever wants to, uh, you know, share any information or like, ask a question or anything um you could just contact me on social media um and uh i'm just excited to talk about baseball it's been a bit of a drought um with with the way that this year is going for everybody so um i was i was like pumped up about this before i felt like we had a game or something uh getting ready for this so uh i'm just really 
excited. I love, love, love talking about baseball. And, you know, um, I know that I share, like all coaches and players, this, like, just this enthusiasm for the game, you know, that never goes away. That's so cool. That really bonds the, the community together. So um, just, yeah, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it.